right, all roads lead to libertarian. And this morning, as we look at how people come to this libertarian position, I think it would be fun and have already had each of our panelists take the world's smallest political quiz. And if you look just behind them here on the podium, you'll see that each of them has scored handsomely on the test. And as you see, you can come from the right or the left. What would be fun also is let's have, let's have a show of hands of all the people here who came to libertarian ideas from the left. Raise your hands. Okay. And those of you who came from the right, raise your hands. And those of you who didn't know where you were. Okay. <laughs> I fall in that latter category, folks. We're going to take written questions from the audience. So if you will, uh, write down any questions that occur to you as our panelists speak. There will be people walking down these two middle aisles, so if you'll pass your questions to the people uh, sitting next to the aisle, then we can pick up those questions and folks will bring them up to the uh, front and we will have a period of uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, the way that we will work our agenda this morning is that I will introduce uh, our first speaker. They will, he will make his opening remarks. Then I will introduce our second speaker. He will make his opening remarks. After which, uh, I will be asking them some questions, which they will handle just seated here comfortably. And there perhaps will be a little bit of crosstalk. And then we will go to your questions from the audience. Let me begin, then, by introducing to you Richard Dennis, who was born and educated in Chicago. He graduated from DePaul University. He started in his career in the commodities business at the age of 17 as a runner for a brokerage house. At 21, he held his first seat on a small exchange, and at 27, he had become quite successful, and the New York Times Magazine profiled him and his success on the Chicago Board of Trade. Other publications have described his achievements, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Fortune USA Today, Barron's, and Esquire. His views have been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, the Atlantic Monthly, and his commentaries have been heard by lots of us on American Public Radio, and perhaps where you may have seen him before is on PBS's Firing Line series. He's now pre president of New Perspectives Quarterly, president of the Chicago Resource Center, chairman of the advisory board of the Drug Policy Foundation. Dr drug relegalization is one of Rich's um, big interests. It's an issue uh, of passion for him. And he serves on the boards of Cato, the Chicago Council of Foreign Relations. But most important, at least to my 11-year-old baseball fan nephew, is that he is a, one of the owners of the Chicago White Sox. So would all of you sh baseball fans and libertarians please join me in welcoming Rich Dennis from the left. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carol Ann, for that very nice introduction. I have the feeling you're going to want to know about those parts that don't have me at 100 and 100 on this chart. I don't know why I think that, but uh, maybe when we get to the questions and answers, we can find uh, out why Joe is a better libertarian than I am. Um, as I begin telling you uh, why I became a libertarian from being a liberal, um, I'll probably alienate any uh, liberals left in the audience. I'm resolved to that. But I'll probably alienate a lot of libertarians, too. In fact, a friend of mine who's a priest, who's a hardcore libertarian, told me that when I say some of the things I'm going to say here today, that I will be, in his words, crucified. 
He assured me, though, that I'd be crucified non-coercively. <laughs> uh, my philosophical odyssey has taken me through Catholicism, Objectivism, Logical Positivism, Keynesianism, Friedmanism, lots of isms. In fact, when uh, I gave this priest friend of mine the speech, he said he would continue to pray for me. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's uh, to try to get me back in the fold, or if he's a little worried what's going to happen when I finish this speech vis-a-vis -vis the crowd here. Um, be that as it may, uh, uh, I'm willing to take uh, whatever non-coercive fate you have uh, open for me. Ayer may have convinced me, Ayer and the positivists, uh, that ethical statements are inherently subjective, subject to no ultimate justification. I guess I think, though, that uh, there's a lot more practical agreement on ends than people generally talk about in ethics. It seems to me that there's not much difference between going east if you want to go to New York and uh, valuing intellectual pursuits more than mindless materialism, for example, if one values uh, the examined life. But I'll admit, this species of positivism has a way of uh, wounding traditional philosophy at its core. And I guess I can only say what's true is true, and I believe that there's a lot to be said for the positivist analysis, and uh, it's true whether we like it or not. When fundamental ends, though, fundamental ends are at uh, issue, I don't believe anything can compel agreement, be it human nature, natural rights, God's will, or whatever. A person whose fundamental intuition is that people are like ants on a, in an anthill, or a Hitler who believes that humanity is his cannon fodder, have fundamentally different values not subject to argumentation. As a practical matter, it's more important to contest the effects of these ideas than it is to feel morally superior to them. Um, but that didn't sound like a crucifixion. <laughs> I don't find any of the natural law or natural rights theories of absolute values effective. There certainly is a human nature, but I don't see how you get from is to ought. It is in our nature to procreate, to preserve our lives, to form friendships. These are considered good. It's also in our nature to uh, be jealous and die, which is bad. Good things which are unnatural abound. Prosthetic medical devices, giving one's life for one's country, sit-ups, I'm a little short on the sit-ups. Uh, but they, indeed, are good things. It is, as libertarians assert, unnatural to own another man. It is also wrong. But I don't believe it's wrong because it's unnatural. In fact, slavery seemed all too natural just 200 years ago. It's wrong because it doesn't yield the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, I suspect libertarians think their values, both in the sum of their long-term implications and their short-run effects, think their values ever result in the greatest good for the greatest number. If there were a conflict, I don't believe very many people would opt for the truly non-utilitarian solution. Now, I used to call myself a liberal libertarian, but the liberal part is fading fast. This is because of the, my change in views on the nature of government and the nature of man, and I've become convinced that government is much more coercive than people generally realize. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, my embrace of libertarian is not un libertarianism is not unconditional. I do f share fundamental libertarian beliefs, but I believe them to be correct sentiments and not absolute moral dictates. 
I believe libertarians are correct in their quest to limit government sharply, but some outcomes would be catastrophic and justify exceptions, such as people dying in front of hospital emergency rooms for lack of insurance or starving to death in front of the Wrigley Building. So, although it might be a hard uh, term to uh, get coined into the uh, general discussion of politics these days, I consider myself a relativist libertarian. I may be the only relativist libertarian there is, uh, but in practical terms, how I translate that into real politics would be to limit government intrusion by requiring escalated majorities to pass laws of an increasingly punitive nature. I call this concept supermajoritarianism, and I'll describe it in more detail later. Well, here comes the crucifixion part. <laughs> no, I'll do the liberal part first. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can soften you up a little. Liberals don't appreciate the extent to which government pushes people around. Sometime I wish every liberal could experience the pleasure of an IRS audit year after year after year. <laughs> or waste millions of dollars on counterproductive paperwork. Uh, it's hard also for anyone who values liberty to defend a government that has powers like eminent domain. What that means generally is that they're going to uh, knock down your house and put up a baseball park around it. Now, true, your house may have been on second base otherwise, but uh, and when they take your tax dollars uh, out of one pocket to pay for the stadium, and on the other hand, take your house, I think we've sort of gone the complete route of uh, coercion by the government. I think it's important also to note the systematic inefficiency of government. I know bureaucracy is a problem in large private corporations, but it's even more of a problem in government. A bungling corporation eventually feels the pinch in its bottom line. Government, because it has its revenue delivered to it by force, doesn't have that constraint. In fact, the government's de facto bottom line is the federal budget deficit, and even today that's no disincentive. Almost uniquely among institutions, government is designed for inefficiency. I think liberals fail to see also that bureaucracies are paradigm cases of the peril of ignoring self-interest. Take, for example, the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA is driven to defend its reputation by aggressively denying people the choice of what kind of risks they'll take. This behavior is perfectly rational from the point of view of the DEA, but it runs roughshod over sick people's real interests. And we're all too familiar what happens when government is captured by special interests. Subsidies to millionaire farmers, million dollar payments to wealthy sugar growers, private schools in Chicago that spend $9,000 per public high school student and turn out illiterates. A Chicago Housing Authority whose costs are so high that they could put the people up in Gold Coast apartments around here and save money. <laughs> All these perversities are not random events. They are the direct result of no political accountability, either bureaucratic or electoral. Third, liberals focus too much on social and political outcomes to the exclusion of worrying about the means to those ends. I believe they are correct in asserting there is no excuse for racism, sexism, homophobia, and a host of other social ills. They go astray, however, by paying insufficient attention to what constitutes proper means to achieving those ends. The liberal catechism holds, for example, that if bank runs are bad and federal insurance prevents them from happening, then insure them. This may be the simplest and most direct route to the end they seek, but it completely ignores the disciplining role of risk, and worse, ignores the long-term cost of setting bad precedents, 
In this case, the president wrongly established is the desirability of the riskless society. Liberals habitually act as if self-regard plays little role in society and even less in government bureaucracies. The best example, I suppose, of focusing on outcomes and annoying incentives is the hopelessly misguided war on drugs. <laughs> Government has made the moral judgment that drugs are bad, therefore people shouldn't take them, therefore drugs should be illegal. But that calculation ignores human nature. People will continue to take drugs no matter what the law says. By establishing a lucrative black market for drugs, the war on drugs creates incentives for people to push drugs. And even worse, it sets a horrible precedent by injecting a whole new level of paternalistic intervention in people's lives. Liberals must learn that unintended consequences will consistently overwhelm desired outcomes if inefficient attention is paid to fallible human nature, self-interest, and precedent setting. My fourth argument with liberalism is its tendency to encourage groupism. It defines rights in terms of groups instead of stressing universal rights appealing to everyone. This leads to convolutions like affirmative action in which in the name of redressing discrimination against minorities, other minorities such as Asians wind up being discriminated against because they're too successful. The inherent unfairness of this approach is at least partly responsible for the sliding popularity of liberalism in the Democratic Party. It is not in a citizen's interest to vote to punish himself for past acts he doesn't condone and didn't practice. In keeping with the fairness doctrine, I know it's coercive, it's time, I think, to enumerate some of the problems I have with libertarianism. Um, first and foremost, I think it's the philosophy and its proponents tend too much towards absolutism. Dave Berglund has said, Every, each person has an absolute right to control his or her own life, body, speeches, actions, and honestly acquired, acquired property. Problems arise when we apply absolutist approaches to practical problems. Should we draw the line on a citizen's right to bear arms at guns, machine guns, surface-to-air missiles, thermonuclear weapons? The justification of this absolutism is libertarianism's deus ex machina called natural rights. So far as I can see, its only appeal is polemical. Certainly individuals existed before governments. Certainly there is a sphere of privacy that ought to be off limits to government coercion. But what pre-existed law was the natural state of anarchy. And in that state, everyone had the ability to do what they liked, but no one had the right to be free from aggression. Without universal consent about values, for example, where no one wants the freedom to murder, there is no way I can see to differentiate freedoms. In their private moments, natural rights libertarians admit all acts of government have an air of illegitimacy. This tells me that naturalists would be philosophical anarchists without their belief in natural law, and therefore they know they need a fudge factor to limit anarchy. Second, libertarians lack sufficient points of light. They, they show very little interest in promoting values that need not bear the force of law. For libertarians, the moral and the legal are absolutely separated in theory and widely separated in fact. People correctly want moral social outcomes and they want their public figures to advocate them. To focus exclusively on limiting government will result in an inability to talk about how the spirit of liberty ought to prevail in our personal lives and social relations. I find libertarians often object to relatively light government coercions, correctly, but neglect to point out objectionable, albeit legal, behavior that should draw protest. If an employer refused to hire minorities, 
libertarians would correctly defend his legal right to do that. But it seems to me that the employer's action is at least as great a moral offense as some government coercions. Not to point that out with emphasis is a moral and political mistake. It leaves the impression that freedom from legal coercion is the only socio-political issue worth talking about or that limited government is a veiled slogan for justifying bigotry. I also find libertarians are out to lunch on the question of taxation. I think that's why I felt a little short there of perfection on the, uh, on the uh, test. Um, Berglund says, libertarians recognize government favors cannot be handed out without first ripping off someone else. This is the basic reason libertarians advocate an end to the coercive method of government financing functions through taxation and replacing taxation with voluntary methods of government financing. Now, even though I agree taxation is a little more like theft than generally thought, I think it's also a little like getting a bill for emergency surgery done without your consent while you're incapacitated. A lot of us were born in public hospitals to which we were driven on free public roads. We walked public sidewalks to public schools. Meanwhile, taxpayers paid for silos of missiles, forces of police, and courts to protect us. The income tax is not the moral equivalent of armed robbery. It's more akin to the behavior of a pack rat providing something of value than taking the equivalent back. Problematic? Yes. Theft? No. <laughs> That's all right, I forgive you. You know not what you do. Um, well, if you didn't like that, you, won't re you really won't like this. I believe that income redistribution is justified in countries where government power has led directly to concentrations of wealth. I believe it. Pardon? Uh, we can do that in the question and answers. If this seems too statist, I must ask whether anyone would justify a USA of 250 million paupers and one multi-trillionaire. To argue that this outcome is practically impossible is correct. To argue that this outcome is logically impossible is to misunderstand the meaning of certitude. And to duck this lifeboat question is to admit one's principles are not universal. Well, now that I've alienated every member of the audience, uh, let me tell you something what's right about libertarianism, just so we can go off on a more uh, uh, harmonious note here. Government is more coercive than people think. There is no social contract. Government is a group of people who have substantial power at their disposal, which they can and do use to control the rest of us in a great and too many variety of ways. <laughs> Libertarians are right to confront the irresponsibility of democracy. Democracy permits people to act as if there is such a thing as a free lunch. We have a never-ending series of promises of more than the political system can deliver. Libertarians are right in their philosophy of individualism. Clearly, there ought to be a sphere of privacy off limits to government intrusion. In foreign policy, libertarians are correct to promote our national strategic independence. In general, I share the view that we have no business in anyone else's business. Libertarians are right to favor the, the issue, issue of educational choice. To end compulsory education would enable millions of others to do better. An educational system that doesn't have its customers delivered by force of law has a much greater chance of better performance. If we were starting from scratch, the best system would be a supermajoritarianism that made all lawmaking very difficult. We're not starting from scratch, of course, so our best course is to encourage restraint, to limit the impulse to codify sen sentiments shared by majorities. A healthy fear of tyrannies of the majority is appropriate in cases where the Constitution isn't specific. Ultimately, that's why libertarianism, more than liberalism, provides a prescription for what ails us. 
It recognizes both the coercive nature of government and its systematic inefficiency. It relies on self-interest rather than virtue as a social lubricant. And it stresses individual rights instead of a falling grip victim to creeping groupism. When leavened with a less absolutist approach to practical questions like taxation and the welfare state, and with a greater willingness to address moral offenses that exist outside government's purview, libertarianism can indeed light our way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rich. Our next speaker is Joe Sobran. He was born in Detroit in 1946. He grew up in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a place that's hard to spell. <laughs> he attended public schools there and graduated from Eastern Michigan University with a major in English. In 1972, he joined the staff of Bill Buckley's National Review, where he's now critic at large. Since 1979, he's been a syndicated, syndicated columnist. He writes for Uni Universal Press Syndicate. For 11 years, he was a regular commentator on CBS Radio's Spectrum. He's the author of one book, Single Issues, and he's currently writing another book on Shakespeare. Before the Gulf War, he was co-founder of the Committee to Avert a Mideast Holocaust. We could all use that. During that time, his turn to libertarianism and non-interventionist policies and positions put him at odds with many of his fellow conservatives. And he now lives in Arlington, Virginia. And I think that uh, being so close to the center of uh, coercive activities there in Arlington, he has a good insight on uh, why some conservatives might want to uh, join us here at the top of the chart. Joe Sobrin. Thank you, Carol Ann. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With the um, events in, I guess we can say Russia now, uh, I keep hearing that we won the Cold War. I always want to ask, what do you mean, we, comrade? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, Seems to me that what we've won, what the U.S. has won, is the dubious honor of now being the global socialist motherland. Uh, or as I always like to say, the U.S. Constitution poses no serious threat to our form of government. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a little uneasy about calling myself a libertarian. It's a, it's a word that others have given a certain meaning to already, a certain set of associations, which may not apply to me. I'd be a Johnny-come-lately if I were to get up and announce and offer myself as a kind of model libertarian. And if I can't take the full range of standard libertarian positions and attitudes, I feel uh, kind of presumptuous claiming the label. I don't think there should be drug laws, and I doubt that there should be any taxes. But, but I do think that abortion is a moral horror and that the law should at least sternly discourage it. I don't think this is a... I don't think this is... A, simply a libertarian issue. I'll tell you why. I won't try to persuade you, but I'd like you to see how it appears to me. It seems to me a little as if the state had withdrawn all protection from, say, children under three. Well, that would give parents more choice, but it would also injure the liberty of children under three. Not just the liberty, but the rights of children, all the rights of children under three. The question you have to settle is not whether people have rights, 
but whether certain entities are people who are entitled to rights. And that's prior to libertarianism. Anyway, that's, that's how the question seems to me. And I concede that any libertarian who disagrees with me about abortion is entitled to say that I'm not a true libertarian. My problem is that I can't go back to being a garden variety conservative because I can't follow that party line anymore either. I think the, the great evil of the modern world is evidently the modern state. And organized conservatism has played its part actively and passively in helping that baneful institution to exist and to go on existing and to get even worse. So let me put my position as modestly as I can. I feel closer to libertarianism by and large than to any other position currently on the political market. I've learned more from libertarians than from any other school of thought. I have a great deal of common ground with libertarians, and I'm deeply indebted intellectually to many of them. In fact, some of my best friends are libertarians. <laughs> Hell, some of my best friends are anarchists. Let, let me be honest. Now, if all this sounds as if I'm just picking and choosing positions arbitrarily, I can only explain I'm still in the process of working my views out. But my own shift away from orthodox American conservatism came out of my study of the Constitution. It became clear to me years ago that the federal government has arrogated to itself hundreds of powers that simply have no basis whatever in the U.S. Constitution. I, it was cl clear to me as a conservative that liberal appeals to the Constitution were really fraudulent. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments weren't taken seriously, and of course taken together the Ninth and Tenth Amendments say this, that the rights of the people in the Constitution, the list of the rights of the people in the Constitution is not exhaustive, but the list of the government's powers in the Constitution is exhaustive. It's that simple, and if you don't understand that, you don't understand the Constitution, you don't understand the original American founders' idea of liberty. They, one after another, Bern, Bernard Segan's very good on this, if you've ever read his writings. One after another, the, uh, the uh, framers of the Constitution said that the powers not, dele not specifically delegated to the federal government are reserved to the people, and the, the federal government can't have anything that's not clearly in the Constitution. And that, of course, has been obliterated. The Roosevelt Court in 1940 pronounced the Tenth Amendment a truism. Now, if it's a truism, it's worthless. It's, uh, it amounts to saying that, yeah, the jackals get to eat the lion's leftovers. That's, that's all the that states' rights amounts to. Um, anyway, all that, all that became clear to me fairly easily. The hard part for me personally was that last year I found that liberalism was only part of the problem. The military establishment, miscalled national defense, <laughs> clearly goes far beyond anything the authors of the Constitution had in mind or would have approved. <laughs> a, a book I learned a lot uh, about this from, by the way, was Robert Nisbet's The Present Age, published a couple of years ago. I saw a copy of it for sale, in fact, yesterday, so if some, some, one of you gets there before I do, uh, you, you can uh, buy it. But uh, Nisbet's one of the few conservatives, it seems to me, who took the, uh, took the problem of militarism seriously. This has not been a, a conservative virtue, by and large. And as long as the Cold War went on, my own anti-communism, which was the beginning of my political passion, allowed me to accept this as a necessity of national survival. 
When the Cold War ended in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, I counted it as good and over. I thought we could finally cut our military down to size, return the money to the taxpayers, and become a normal society again. But, but all, almost immediately, of course, George Bush ordered an invasion of Panama, and a few months later, he deployed nearly half a million troops to Saudi Arabia. I thought both these actions were completely unwarranted. It had always seemed plausible to me to say the Soviet Union posed a danger to the United States, but it seemed absurd to suggest that Saddam Hussein or Manuel Noriega posed a threat to us. But, by the way, wasn't the incarceration of Noriega supposed to end the drug traffic? Anyway, to, to my dismay, most of my fellow conservatives supported both these military actions. And at risk of oversimplifying the matter in a way that's unfair to them, I concluded that they were simply not serious about cutting government down to its proper size. I suggested in uh, one debate last year that conservatives should learn to think of war as a huge federal spending program. Then they might oppose it once in a while. And I, I jibe that conservatives really don't mind big government as long as it's shooting something. <laughs> but the, the issue went deeper. Uh, making war is the most serious thing the state can ever do. In fact, as Randolph Bourne said, war is the health of the state. Not only were these wars not required by our national interest, they were downright wicked but I found that few conservatives felt any moral qualms about them, as long as foreigners were doing most of the dying. Now, I saw very clearly that my enemies weren't in Baghdad. They were in Washington. <laughs> Saddam Hussein wasn't taking our earnings every day and threatening us with prison if we refused to comply. George Bush was. But the standard attitude of conservatives, as nearly as I could make it out, was that these evil wars actually redeemed everything else the government did. So for me, it became clear that American conservatism had lost its way. Conservatives were no longer interested in making the state justify itself in terms of either the Constitution or first principles. The great conservative philosopher Michael Oakeshott wrote that governing is ideally quote, a specific and limited activity. The state, if it's to exist at all, must be confined to a few carefully defined and strictly controlled functions. The taxing power, if it is to exist at all, must never be used promiscuously. And about the only people I saw taking this view seriously were libertarians. Conservatives like to feel we are winning whether we is the conservative movement, the Republican Party, the U.S. military, or the West. This feeling of political triumph seems sufficient to distract conservatives from the simple fact that at a much more basic level, we, we citizens, we individuals, are still constantly losing, losing our freedom, losing it just as surely under Ronald Reagan and George Bush as under Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. So I've, I've come to believe that conservatism, though it's politically strong, offers no real challenge to the state, whereas libertarianism, though politically weak, does offer a real challenge. And the kind of victory conservatives are willing to settle for isn't worth having. But the kind of victory libertarians dream of is worth fighting for against any odds. Thank you very much.
Thank you both. Thank you so much for your comments. Wow. Let's, uh, let's start in with a couple of questions that I'd like to pose to each of you. Uh, first, uh, let me go uh, to Rich and, and give Joe just a chance to uh, have a sip of water before I go back to him. Uh, Rich, if you could recommend uh, one or perhaps two books to uh, your friends on the left uh, to help them uh, out of their uh, blindness, let's say, <laughs> what would those books be? Well, I'm tempted to say one of them would be the uh, federal budget uh, for 1991. <laughs> Um, I've got a peculiar recommendation. Uh, I'd start in the middle. I wouldn't start with books. I would read the many good publications of libertarian organizations. Uh, Reason Magazine, uh, the output of the Cato Institute, a whole series of newsletters by other people. I know that uh, Joe writes some for, for, for one of them. And uh, I know that's not sort of where you sort of be, get the, uh, the philosophical roots of it, but sometimes it's not bad to start in the middle and then go back to what specific things are of interest to you. Thank you. Joe, same question to you. Uh, your friends on the right, what would you recommend to them? Well, a lot of them have already read the books I'd recommend to them, but they've had no effect. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or haven't had the desired effect. There are a few passages in the Federalist Papers I'd certainly call their close attention to about the dangers of standing armies, about the typical corruption of uh, Republican governments, and about uh, the, especially about s states' rights. I'd call attention to the fact that Madison stresses that the powers of the federal government are to be few and defined, and to deal mostly with foreign matters, whereas the powers of the states are to remain quote, numerous and indefinite. That's a little thing, though, in a way. I, I just wish they were more saturated in the books they praise. Uh, but I think for, for a good short read, uh, Bastias the Law is hard to beat. In, in, in fact, I, uh, I just didn't know many libertarians along the way. I was, most of my friends were conservatives with a lot of libertarian uh, impulses, and um, the, uh, the the law was a book I read when I was 19, and one sentence and it stayed with me. I just didn't know what to do with it. It's the one where Bastiat says that the moral test of any law is whether it authorizes the state to do something that would be criminal for a private individual to do. <laughs> There are, so many, there are so many things like counterfeiting and extortion that we call crimes when you and I do them, and we call policies when the government does them. <laughs> and, the other, and I guess the other thing I would recommend to everyone is uh, Michael Oakeshott's beautiful essays in Rationalism in Politics. That's the book that's probably had the deepest effect on me and did, in a roundabout way, lead me in a libertarian direction. Just, Thank you both. Excuse me, it's just been reprinted, by, by the way, by Liberty Press in one of those beautiful th volumes for uh, only seven dollars. It's an incredible deal. Some of the most wonderful prose written in the century, I think. Thanks, okay. both of you. Uh, before I ask the next question, I just want to mention that uh, Rich Dennis has also uh, published uh, his opinions in uh, Reason Magazine and is on the board of directors of Reason Magazine. The next question is, um, what happened to make you question uh, your belief that, that first shook your, your, your faith, let's say, or questioned your belief that government needs to regulate um, personal behavior? Well, uh, I've considered myself a, a libertarian for a long time, uh, and I don't think I had a... Uh, sort of a St. Paul knocked off his horse uh, conversion. But uh, I guess I first believed, came to believe government wasn't all it's cracked up to be at a convention. The last convention that was here in Chicago, the Democratic Convention in 1968. Um, it seemed to me that there was a, uh, 
a uh, an incredibly easy turn to uh, s s incredibly statist uh, uh, police actions. Um, while still our rhetoric was uh, pledging to the Constitution. And it made me think that uh, the appetite for regulating everything and everybody was very strong. And if it wasn't limited, uh, we could go off the deep end really fast. Uh, I, I guess another sort of later thing is, is the war on drugs, clearly, where we take uh, all too literally the, uh, the rhetoric of uh, uh, paternalism and uh, authoritarianism. And if uh, there's no better example to me of uh, how pervasive in people's lives government can become as, as what we've done in the war on drugs. Thank you. And uh, Joe, what, what was it? What event, what set of circumstances uh, caused you to question uh, your belief that government needs to regulate personal behavior? Well, I guess it was the people who are actually executing the uh, this my son was uh, it was a lot of little things I remember a, a vague feeling when people I'd see drug busts on TV and you know federal authorities today raided blah 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 and they'd show people being let off in handcuffs and I sort of thought gee uh, you don't have to do it on my account I mean <laughs> Well, the whole idea, if anyone still remembers, I, I love what Jack Nicholson says in Easy Rider. This most patriotic thing I ever heard. He says, you know, this used to be a hell of a good country. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the old idea of America was the government was acting for us. So it should be an extension of ourselves to the extent that it exists. And I didn't feel that way about it. I mean, I felt like this, this was something essentially authoritarian that was going on and the um, then my son was arrested a couple of years ago for smoking marijuana and I didn't especially like him smoking marijuana but when he just told me about the petty harassment that he would got from this cop and so on I, I thought oh gee really does this does this have to happen I can give him a little talk on marijuana like I give him a little talk on 99 things and uh, That'll, that'll do. That's, that's all he needs. I didn't see why he should have a record and the threat of prison and all that hanging over him for, for something like that. I mean, everyone knows that's nothing. I mean, I smoked marijuana when I was a kid, so, you know, two times, or wild youth. <laughs> but still, yeah, right. I, like all politicians. I'm not running for office. I haven't been appointed to anything. But... Uh, <laughs> And my chances grow dimmer by the day. But anyway, I thought, big deal. We have these, this multi-billion dollar war on drugs. Is this what it's for? To put, so this cop can harass my kid? Oh, come on. I wasn't even that mad about it. It was just so silly. That's all. That sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Here's one that uh, I like to ask to folks, to all libertarians as I meet them. I think it uh, gives us all a little bit of personal insight into uh, who we are. And uh, it's also fun. And this time I'm going to start with, uh, with Joe and then go to Rich. Um, what was your reaction when you heard the word libertarian for the very first time? What, what emotion did you feel or uh, uh, just what did you think? Well, I always thought libertarians were pretty good on most things. You know, I just thought they, they took it too far and they tended, I thought, and I still think this is true of some, that Americans tend to confuse the moral and the legal. If something is immoral, they think it ought to be illegal. On the other hand, conservatives seem to me to make the complementary error, which, it, I mean, libertarians often make the complementary error, which is to think if something should be legal, it must be regarded as moral. And it seems to me there's a very sharp distinction you have to keep in mind there. But libertarians in general, I was always, I just, as I say, I didn't really know any for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I, oddly enough, I had to come to Washington before I met a lot of libertarians. <laughs> I think you have to be right there to feel the full revulsion. I mean, <laughs> well, 
like, I mean, you see these crooks every day, you run into them around town. It's not that they're all crooks, but they're very ordinary guys with very small minds, and you think, why should these guys have such leverage over everyone else? It's not a matter of thinking government is evil. It's a matter of just thinking it's kind of absurd. It's, it's crazy <laughs> that Barney Frank should be telling us how to run our lives. I mean, <laughs> And I really don't want to tell him how to run his. I have a few suggestions, <laughs> but they're not commands. That's all. Thanks. Rich? Um, I guess I thought it was libertine and just got confused, you know. <laughs> uh, but is, I had bought the book, so I thought I'd read them anyway. Um, um, and the book, no, that's not literally true. Um, but uh, probably first heard the word and something by Ayn Rand, and uh, was probably pretty young and didn't have a whole lot of uh, philosophical grounding and all that. But I guess the instinctive idea that came to me about the word was here was something that was the opposite of kind of blah, middle of the road conformism. No sort of specific idea attached to it, but here were people who uh, didn't aspire to be men in gray flannel suits. and. Uh, that had a lot of appeal, and it still does. Thanks. We'll go to questions from the audience now, and boy, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of them. Several, several of them seem to uh, uh, focus on your uh, point of view on taxation, Rich, as you There's probably... There's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'll pose one that sort of encapsulates uh, several questions and seems to... Uh, or encapsulates me, I suppose. <laughs> No, not really. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, let's, uh, let's take this one. It says, um, um, well, I lost it here. Just come back to it, Carol Ann. Ah, here. Let's do income redistribution. That one, that one is a, a good one, too, and then we'll come back to the taxes one when I find it. Uh, this, is, this says, uh, you need income, you said income redistribution is necessary to avoid situations such as 250 million paupers and one multi-trillionaire. Uh, if exchange is voluntary and mutually be beneficial, how could such a situation arise? Well, I didn't say it was necessary to avoid it. I said that that, that situation was practically impossible. But I think the general answer to the idea of the why taxation and, and income redistribution has a, a possible uh, rationale is the concept of public goods. Libertarians have strained long and hard to get rid of the idea that there are public goods, things that have to be procured and pros uh, uh, made uh, real collectively. Now, there sure aren't many of them and we ought to privatize all the things that we can, but I, I don't see solutions to the problem of uh, every public good that I think that most people would accept. If you accept the idea that are irreducible public goods, you accept the idea of a public sphere, and uh, I think somebody could well define a very skewed level of income distribution as uh, not a public good. Thank you. Did you want to have comments? Joe, uh, let me pose one to you. Do you have any major disagreements with libertarianism other than the abortion issue? Well, I, as I say, my views are sort of unsettled. I mean, I may wind up uh, denouncing libertarianism from an anarchist point of view if my, <laughs> my friend <laughs> prevails with me. I don't know. But uh, now I must, I must say one thing I really love about libertarians is this sort of bohemian attitude they have. On the other hand, I wonder if that's, I mean, I, I think if the necktie is ever abolished, it'll be thanks to libertarianism. <laughs> but I also wonder about something else. It's like, like I say, the, the, there is this tendency in libertarianism, I think, to almost invite the libertine confusion that Rich speaks of, and the, uh, um, 
you, you know, you don't have to convert uh, dope peddlers and pornographers and so on to libertarianism. You have to convert Mormons. <laughs> and I think it can be done if you very firmly keep in mind this distinction between uh, the legal and the moral, you know, and, and to bring it home to people. You're not trying to secure a kind of public approval of all the things that you would not punish. It's just that, well, look, it, in, it used, people, Europe had religious wars for centuries because people were afraid of religious anarchy. Well, we have religious anarchy. We really do. Only it's called religious freedom. We take it for granted. And if you just make people see the analogies, they, it's amazing to me the fear of chaos that people have. After a century of Stalin and Hitler and Mao Zedong and Castro and so on, and George Bush, uh, uh, <laughs> what are they still afraid of? The robber barons. How many people did Rockefeller and Gould kill? Uh, it's an amazing fact, but there it is. People have this terrible fear of chaos. And you've got you've to cope with that. You've got to reach that. Uh, I really hope that libertarianism can, you know, really break open the two-party system. But you've got to watch how you do it. Thanks. Don't run me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I think I'm going to make sure that uh, uh, both Rich and Joe get uh, some of our advocate tapes. I'm going to uh, give Rich the one, uh, does uh, wrong become right if the majority approve? And I'm, I'm going to make sure that uh, Joe gets the one about not using the A words, including anarchist, abolish, and a few other things. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll be reprogrammed then? <laughs> Uh, going back to that tax question, uh, Rich, if the individual is the owner of his or her own life, how do you justify saying the income tax is not armed robbery, uh, i.e., the property to be taxed is not owned by the government? Property is a construct. It. Uh Private property clearly doesn't exist everywhere. It doesn't have to exist. And where it exists, it exists to some extent by virtue of protections that's afforded it in the legal system. If you really want to have private property and pay no taxes, uh, then I suspect that you're doing something illogical to call the police when you, if you get robbed, or more realistically, uh, call the court if somebody breaks a contract. I don't think you can absolutely have no public sphere and, at, and, and have uh, the concept of private property. And, you know, the way the question was posed, if, if you are the owner of your body, if that's an absolute, then maybe you can run it up the flagpole of uh, all sorts of other implications. I just doubt that it's an absolute in the way that, uh, that the libertarians think, because I doubt there are any absolutes of that nature. Thank you. Including that one. <laughs> Here's a question for both of you. Uh, someone wondered which questions on the world's smallest political quiz you answered uh, no or maybe to, and I'm going to hand you back your quizzes so that you can uh, take those. Uh, Joe's is here, and then yours is underneath, Rich. Joe, would you go first and, and answer that question, please? Well, I, I gave a maybe to the proposition, end taxes, pay for services voluntarily, only in this sense, that uh, if a minimal state uh, must exist, then it must be paid for somehow. And I'd, uh, I would certainly favor the uh, minimal tax and the weakest enforcement mechanisms to, to cover that. Uh, there, there was a time when the government did take relatively little of the of the economy, uh, shaved off enough to pay the cops and the uh, White House janitors, but uh, it wasn't itself a serious factor. Now the government has become, in an important sense, an economy unto itself, almost one, in fact, it does dominate the free economy. There are two economies now. We talk as if there were one. I'm, I would be willing to live with the original federal system if 
the contract were adhered to. And I'd let, I guess I'd let the idealists uh, fight it out. Uh, I probably wouldn't be interested in politics if that were, if we stuck to the Constitution. So, and so I'd, to I'd tolerate taxes in, in that case, I guess. But uh, this is nowhere near saying that the present use of the taxing power is justified for the present form. Thank you, Jim. Rich? Well, aside from the tax question on which you've undoubtedly decided at this point I'm wrong, uh, the only thing that I dredged up a maybe here about is let people immigrate and emigrate freely. Now, it, it's my personal opinion that we should let as many people in this country as want to. I, and if I had to choose yes or no, I'd certainly choose yes. But, I mean, how many, I mean, when I think of the question, I always think of extremes. How about five billion people? Would we let five billion people in this country? I would. I'd take, I'd take my chances. I'd probably buy a place in Montana, but uh, I would. At some point, the process of letting those people in seems to me to inevitably involve such a negative reaction from such a large percentage of the population that I think is a practical issue it would be wrong to un, un, endorse unlimited uh, immigration. Any amount of immigration that anybody can imagine being allowed, I'm for. But I can imagine an amount of immigration, uh, an arbitrarily large amount, that would uh, create such a reaction that we might want to think twice. Thanks. Uh, Joe, I'd like to uh, go to a question uh, that refers to your time as a uh, radio commentator. It says, uh, you were once a commentator on CBS radio. Did your discovery of libertarianism have anything to do with your, your um, leaving radio commentary? Uh, no, I don't think so because uh, that was, uh, well, let's see, the, they canceled the show altogether after 20 some years. I'd been there the last half of that time. and. I had, uh, my principles are pretty much what they were. I mean, I think conservatism has changed more than I have. There was a time when, as uh, Sheldon Richman has written uh, uh, extensively and eloquently about, conservatism in America was extremely emphatic about the Constitution and was accused of isolationism before World War II, for example. So I thought I was really sticking to what most conservatives really believed. I didn't realize how much enthusiasm there was just for uh, Nintendo uh, on, the, on the right. Uh, well, it's, that's, that's unfair. I mean, there, there really is a kind of vision there among um, many conservatives. But I, I, I was aghast to find that for most of them, the Cold War didn't mean the end of a huge military in this country that the military had become an end in itself, that in fact the Cold War was like all of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, emergency measures. Uh, and, the, and the war on poverty that Lyndon Johnson said would be abandoned if it didn't succeed. These, these institutions are all self-perpetuating. And anyway, the, uh, I, I really was sorry, in fact, that the uh, program was canceled at the very time when I was uh, starting to hit my stride on a few of these things. It was an unfortunate accident. Thanks. Just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, this question says, please comment on the dismal failure of the media to bring the full extent of government greed and waste to the attention of the public. Um, says, I've heard for instance, I've heard the press on the new Congressional Junior Executive Office building multi-story, multi-million dollar at Union Station. N nothing. Heard nothing on that. So that's an example. Yeah. Um, well, I shouldn't say this, but in, in Washington there's an expression for people who live outside Washington. Suckers. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you people pay for everything, you know. We get free movies and cheap subway rides and all kinds of things that, uh, and the, uh, 
Yeah, but it doesn't get into the media because really the media are, they don't know what to do. They really have never discovered what to do with themselves. They tell stories. That's what they are. The media, I, I used to have some misconceptions about this. The media are engaged not in informing, but in dramaturgy. And they love a hostage crisis, you know. That's great soap opera. That'll run for weeks. Uh, really, in the, I mean, I don't mean to belittle the plight of hostages, of course, but really, what proportion does that bear to our real concerns? I mean, if anyone's tragedy is bad for that person, but how many people's trage personal tragedies deserve to be 12-day stories on the news? Uh, they don't know how to define issues, so they stick with very conventional storylines. And they give us these serials all the time. They're not going to inform you on all that stuff. You have to develop what you might call paramedia, which are focused on real substantive issues. And eventually, if you get big enough, you'll break into the media stories on things. I hope the media this year can be persuaded to give some attention to, the, to libertarianism, because there's not going to be an interesting race, obviously. Uh, I'm getting long-winded here, but yeah. just one more, if I may make, just, just add one more comment. Everybody's saying that the Democrats aren't putting up a good candidate against Bush because he's unbeatable. I don't believe this. Gold, uh, Johnson was unbeatable in 64, Reagan was unbeatable in 84, and yet both opposition parties thought it was important to put someone up against those guys, and it was, they were right. Principles were at stake. With Bush, no principles at stake. <laughs> the Democrats know that Bush is a perfectly adequate custodian of their institutions. He poses no threat to them. And for that reason, I think that Libertarians have a real opportunity this year to break out, to get some attention, to offer an alternative, to appeal to disaffected conservatives, too, and uh, to, to reach a lot of people who uh, otherwise won't vote. You know, the, I voted to my regret for Bush in 88 because I didn't want to waste my vote by voting for Ron Paul. <laughs> I wasted it. I wasted it. That was the stupidest logic ever. And if you can do what George Wallace did in 68, just say, send them a message. You can send a message. And that's, that's the way to appeal. Make it a protest vote. That's what it has to be this time. But I think it's a, I think it's a great year for libertarians if it's used correctly. Rich, let's go back to you. Uh, this questioner asks, do you realize that a lot fewer people would go hungry in front of the Wrigley Building and a lot fewer would be turned away from hospitals under a libertarian government than under current government because more charity, volunteerism, and personal responsibility would exist under libertarianism? Sorry. Well, I agree with that. I mean, that's why I'm a libertarian. Here's the question, though. You, that assertion that you just made, last time I checked, was not one of the Ten Commandments. That assertion that's just been made is an empirical assertion about the future. Now, you can tell me you think it's 99% likely to be true, 999 .9. I just want to know what the theoretical answer is if it's not. And if you just can't deal with that question, then what you're saying, in effect, is that you don't have an answer to all scenarios. And that's, in fact, what I think is correct. That makes, us, makes me a practical libertarian, a utilitarian libertarian, a uh, instrumental libertarian, and not an absolute one. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Joe, you seem to equate conservatism with the Buckley Human Events party line, uh, the John Birch Society, and others, for example, have always opposed foreign adventurism and have been for more far more consistent in their application of constitutional principles. 
can and should libertarians be building bridges to that kind of conservative? Oh yeah, I think that's true. I, I think that there are a lot of uh, conservatives who just haven't been able to make themselves very audible over the last uh, 40 years because of the prevalence of uh, the anti-communist strand of conservatism. And the, uh, I, I, yes, I do very much. I say I think everyone is libertarian to some degree. Liberals to some degree and on some issues are libertarian. Um, I was always libertarian on a lot of things. I mean, anyone who talks about limited government is to that extent libertarian. So you can reach all sorts of unlikely seeming people. And I think this is the year to do it too. The government is too big, just way too big. Everyone knows it and it's also headed for crisis. So, you know, get there with that message first. Put, uh, put the libertarian spin on it. Thanks. Rich, your second argument that libertarians need to combine individual rights arguments with expressions of personal morality seems inconsistent with your first argument that we have no right to be free from aggression without government. That doesn't make sense. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's a par personal moral commitment of many of many libertarians to protect the moral right of individuals to protest their right to protect their right to choose their defense um, associations without this right there's no right to be free what is your comment on that this is that's one of those essay questions I'm tempted to ask you to read it again but uh, <laughs> um, Well, Joe said it, and I think it's right. Morality is separate from government. Morality is important. In my view, it's subjective. That doesn't make it to me any less important. I don't think it makes a society any less important. Uh, libertarians, I think, mostly agree with that. Maybe they don't, half of them might agree with the subjective part, half wouldn't. But their focus is on what the law is, and that's fine, and that ought to be the bulk of what they do. But uh, what I'm trying to argue is that it shouldn't be all what they should do, and the fact that uh, personal morality is uh, subjective or whatever doesn't, to me, denigrate the value of pursuing it. And I suspect that there's, there's widespread agreement among libertarians what the right moral ethos is also. But uh, if you don't do something, on some level, organizationally, to express that, uh, people will mistake this all for uh, an excuse uh, to, to uh, uh, not talk about those issues. Thanks. Let me follow up with another one with you, Rich. Um, says, um, why don't liberals recognize that it's the working poor who surf suffer most from the welfare state, uh, taxation, and coercive monopolies, um, because the rich can buy their way out? Well, I recognize it. Why don't liberals recognize that? Well, I could be nasty and say they created the state of dependence, <laughs> and uh, it wouldn't behoove them to, justify, to, to recognize what they've done. I think that uh, liberals are uh, somewhat illiterate in economics, and it takes a little bit of economic theory to, uh, to get to that conclusion. Maybe that's a, this, this all a long way of saying they're focusing on the end. They want these people to be less poor. Fine. But they're not focusing on whether the, you, you take the most direct route, handing the money, or maybe there's a more effective long-term route working. Uh, in consonance with some economic principles. Thanks. I'd like to direct this one to each of you in turn. I'll start with Joe. Uh, what do you foresee for the Soviets, or the Russians, I suppose you could say here? Can you equate their situation with Germany after World War II um, with Earhart's economic miracle? Well, I hope that'll be true, of course. I'm afraid, from what I've seen so far, that Russia is simply going to become part of the new world order. It is going to be integrated into the UN, the IMF, the, uh, uh, the World Bank, and all these other international institutions, and it will become one more social democracy with all the usual problems, and possibly the, uh, 
some new militarism down the road someday. It's, it's hard to foresee, but I think they face real dangers now because Yeltsin seems unusually receptive to the, uh, you know, to, I mean, Russia has proved hardy enough to withstand communism, but whether it can survive American advice and aid is, uh, <laughs> is the question now. The other day, the Washington Post had a story, I swear to God, in the style section about a Harvard economist who is going over to Russia with an economic plan. The Wall, the Wall Street, I thought, oh, great. Don't tell me, Professor, it's a five-year plan, right? I mean, <laughs> for, uh, for 70 years, they've had shortages of everything but economic plans. So what do we send them? An economic plan. Brilliant. Well, but, but Yeltsin is listening to this guy. Thanks, Rich. Unfortunately, I've uh, been to Russia recently, so it's hard to be optimistic. Uh, I saw one of the uh, deposed uh, army people on TV saying, you know, in six months people will realize that, that, that political freedom doesn't feed them. And I suspect without some economic miracle that accompanies political freedom, that the, those kinds of people who stage, stage the coup will probably have a shot at having their day again. If you want sort of my indicator whether the Russians are going to have any chance at an economic miracle, I believe it can only come to the extent that they permit international companies and individuals into their country to form economic partnerships. For some, if you spend 74 years in a country where it's never made any difference that you did your job better or worse uh, sooner or later, uh, whether you got more or less educated, you have literally got a country there that sometimes I think there are only a handful of people who have an understanding of what almost every American has intuitively, that sort of if you work hard you can get ahead. They don't believe that at some fundamental level. And the only way I can see they can learn it is from outsiders. If they remain insular, all the rhetoric, all the freedom uh, in the world won't give them anywhere near the economic miracle they need. And it better happen fast because the, uh, cause the, the, uh, the army people are right. Six months, a year from now, if things are worse, people are fickle. Uh, the tanks could be moving the other way. Could I just sure, go ahead and follow up, Joe. We, found, we learned one difference between communism and democracy, though, last week. Under communism, it's still possible to get rid of an incumbent. <laughs> I can, you can kind of tell that he was uh, on the radio, can't you folks? <laughs> This question is for both of you also. Is there any way, and I'll, I'll start with Rich on this, is there any way out of the current federal budget deficit other than much higher taxes or much higher inflation or a party coming to power that will repudiate the national de debt, such as the Populist Party? Um, well, sure there is. Uh, there's less spending. Uh, I would sort of uh, have this disagreement with Milton Friedman where he says that deficits don't matter and it's the level of government spending that matters. Well, I think they both matter, unfortunately, and they're both in the wrong direction. And uh, uh, when you have the inflation option, repudiation is, is, is kind of unnecessary. Um, I, I think that what uh, Joe's been talking about in the military and uh, probably a proportional decrease in what can be decreased in the budget in other areas is the way to go. And I think if you got down to, uh, if we budgeted the military for what we're going to need for the next 10 years and reduced all the other discretionary spending uh, in, it's in some proportion to that, uh, I don't think we'd have a budget deficit now. That's right. Thank you. Um, any other way out, Joe? than higher taxes and higher inflation or a party coming to power that will repudiate? Gee, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, Americans gripe about uh, crooked politicians all the time. 
But to me, it seems that the real structural problem is crooked voters, uh, people who vote other people's wealth into their pockets. I was, I was talking with an anarchist friend the other night who told me he has this problem in his own family. Well, actually, he was telling me that he was talking with a woman who he had a little argument with her. She was saying that, well, he referred to her in passing as being on welfare. She said, wait, I'm not on welfare. This is my right. This is social insurance. And I said, well, why didn't you tell her that you are paying for it and it's taken from you at gunpoint? And, you know, I gave him the great snappy libertarian answer. And he sighed, because it was my mother. Ooh. And, <laughs> and Thanks, I, Joe. <laughs> yeah. How many of our mothers would have to go to the wall, let's face it, if we got our way politically? I just want to say one thing. I mean, I think all what Joe says is probably right, but maybe another way to think about voters, which is even worse in the long run, is that the, they're just falling victim to the government con game, the, the game that promises more than can be delivered, the game that says to you, you can get six things out of government and pay for two of them. And uh, it isn't a, uh, a conscious desire to take from everyone else so much as it is a response to politicians, but also an inherent desire to have something for nothing. But it is uh, corruption is my point, that it, it's moral and intellectual, both. I'd agree with that, yeah. One more quick question. Uh, if you would, just take 30 seconds to answer this one because we're running close on time. How effective have libertarian election campaigns been in, a, in influencing you? First, Joe. I think I had to find out other ways. I don't think that the campaigns really reached me. Uh, shortage of funds, I guess, is the problem. But at any rate, I mean, the, the influence on me came in a lot of other ways, from Ayn Rand to Bastiat and whatever. Thanks. Rich? Regrettably, I have to report I haven't uh, been uh, influenced much by the uh, libertarian campaigns. It, I mean, it's a central problem of politics, how you get on the radar screen, and it's very, very tough. And uh, just because it hasn't happened uh, with me and with a lot of people, don't stop trying, because uh, what you're trying to do is inherently very hard, very improbable, but is in, as hard and improbable as it is, it's just that important also. Would y'all all join me in thanking both of our panelists very much. That concludes our coverage of this panel discussion on libertarian politics. For more information, write to the Libertarian Party. The address is 1528 Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20003. Here is a programming reminder to tune into C-SPAN 2 later tonight for an American profile. We will talk with Henry Cisneros, the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Mr. Cisneros spoke with us back in June about his political career and politics in Texas. That's former mayor Henry Cisneros at 12 midnight Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Pacific Time. Coming up next, it's a forum on recent events in the Soviet Union hosted by the World Affairs Council of Northern California. The C-SPAN 2 schedule is available to viewers 24 hours a day. For the latest information about our programming, dial 202-628 2205. C-SPAN 2, bringing you live coverage of the United States Senate as well as an unedited look at public policy events. Next on C-SPAN 2, a discussion on the breakup of the Soviet Union hosted by the World Affairs Council of Northern California. The title of the forum is Soviet Decentralization, Fact or Fiction, Threat or Opportunity. It featured remarks by Ambassador David Fisher of the World Affairs Council, Tom Tierney of Bain and & Company, and Abel Aganbegin, head of the Soviet Economic Reform Task Force.
I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, which is co-sponsored by the World Affairs Council of Northern California.